We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, good morning, church family. Who's happy to be in God's house this morning? Yeah, for those of you that didn't clap, I'll work on it. I'll, I'll try to get you there. But hey, um, we're in a, wrapping up a series today called I Will Build My Church. And it comes from a direct quote from Jesus Christ. And if you remember, this is the, the last, this is week seven of, of seven weeks. We've been studying what does it mean to be part of this thing called the church? When Jesus says he's going to build it, what does that mean? What is he building? What is it that you and I are a part of? What does that look like? And it's where in, in Matthew uh, 16, verse 18, is where we actually see this promise from Jesus. He looks at Peter and he says, Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. So in this promise, one of the things that it's important that we see is that Jesus is the one who says that he's going to build the church. He doesn't look at Peter and say, Peter, I want you to build my church. He doesn't talk about a church 2,000 years later meeting at 710 Aqua Heart Road and say, I want you all to build my church. What he says, he says to Peter, he says, I, Jesus, I'm going to build my church. When brick gets laid upon brick, laid upon brick, and as that church is being built, I want people to know I'm the one building the church. And so today, we're going to talk about that building process. What does it look like to be part of a church that grows? That's how we're going to wrap up our series. What does it look like to be part of a growing church? A church that grows. Now you understand that growth is kind of twofold. When you're talking about a church, the first thing that comes to your mind when someone says that church is growing, you probably think about width right? You think about numerical growth, the number of people showing up to that church on a Sunday morning. That's what most people think of when they hear a church that's growing. They're talking about width growth. But there's another, and I would say even more important kind of growth that we also need to focus on, and that's called depth growth. That means that you and I are actually, as part of the church, we're becoming more and more like Christ. We are growing in Christ-likeness. But you'll see today that width growth and depth growth are, are intricately connected, that they're so important that they go together. You see, we're called to grow the, the church in depth, which we call discipleship. We're also called to grow the church in width. We call that evangelism. And ultimately, Jesus is the one that makes the church grow. So here's our big idea today. I'm going to put it on the screen. I want you to know it's going to pop up on the screen four times this morning. So hopefully you're going to all kind of walk away with this statement kind of drilled into our heads together. This is a part of the strategy of Arundel Christian Church, and it's this. The best width strategy is a depth strategy. If we want to grow this church wide, if we want to grow the number of people that show up here on a Sunday morning, if we want to grow the number of people that show up one day in heaven and live forever with Jesus in the kingdom of God, we have to understand that the most important strategy to grow this way is to make sure that all of us in this room are growing this way. We have to be growing in our own individual Christ-likeness together as a church family. So we're going to start with width first. In order to make this statement make sense, I want to start with understanding what does it mean to grow wide? What does it mean to have, uh, to do this process called evangelism? So width slash evangelism, that's where we're going to start, and then we're going to talk about depth and discipleship. There's a parable in Scripture 
that only appears one time. A lot of times we expect to read things a few times because Matthew, Mark, and Luke, those three books of the, the New Testament, the first three books of the New Testament, we call them the synoptic gospels. And the reason we call them the synoptic gospels is they're actually quite in line with each other. If you read one and then you read the next one, you would think, I, I think I just read this book, right? They're very similar. The parable I want to read with, uh, together with us this morning is actually only appears in one place, one gospel. And it's in the gospel of Mark. And it's a very, uh, what I would call a lesser known parable. It's a, it's a parable that doesn't appear uh, in our minds. In fact, when I read this, some of you are going to probably think, I've never heard this parable before. If you're in this room and you don't know what a parable is, that's okay. Let me tell you. A parable is a story. When God's trying to explain something heavenly, but he's trying to explain it in words that we understand, he'll, he'll take it and make an illustration that we call a parable. And here's what he says in Mark chapter 4, verse 26. Says Jesus also said, the kingdom of God is like a farmer who scatters seed on the ground. And I know what some of you are thinking right now. I've heard this parable. Yes, the farmer who scatters seeds, it goes to four different places. I've heard this one. This isn't that one. All right, so keep listening. A farmer who scatters seed on the ground. It says night and day while he's asleep or awake, the seed sprouts and grows but he does not understand how it happens. The earth produces the crops on its own. First, a leaf blade pushes through, and then the heads of the wheat are formed, and then finally the grain ripens, and as soon as the grain is ready, the farmer comes and harvests it with a sickle, for the harvest time has come. Well, let me tell you what I think this parable is about. There's, there's different people who teach this parable differently. And I think what this parable is about is it's entirely about the process of evangelism. It's the, the spreading the seed all the way to the place of harvesting the wheat. It's the, from the place of sharing the gospel with someone to the very end part of the process where someone begins a new life with Jesus Christ. That's the whole piece here. Some people would say, no, when the seed sprouts... That's when someone's given their life to Christ, and then they grow and grow and then produce fruit later on in their... No, no, no. This parable is about the process of salvation, of someone hearing the gospel, and at one point coming to a place where the harvest is plentiful, and someone introduces them and gives them an opportunity to give their life to Jesus. Let me tell you why I think that. First of all, I don't know, any of you have green thumbs in here? You really like doing the house plant thing or a garden. You have an outdoor garden or indoor. Uh, you're, you're, you know, one of the things that's amazing, and my, my wife really loves indoor house plants. I mean, she babies them. She knows when there's a new leaf on every single one of them. She'll like get excited. Everybody come and look at the new thing that's happening. It's pretty amazing how excited she gets about these things. Now, it happens and but it's one of those things where we, we kind of know which plants need a little bit more water or which ones like a little bit more sun. And there's a few things that we know, but I'll tell you what, we are clueless for how the actual process of a new leaf or some sort of growth or how when you turn a plant and the leaves the next morning have turned directions. I have no idea how any of that happens. It's a complete mystery. And what this parable is saying is that's exactly like what happens when Jesus builds his church. We are responsible for putting the seed out. By the way, we are the farmer in this parable, the church. It says that the farmer, right, is asleep and doesn't know how this growth is happening. Well, I tell you what, the farmer is not Jesus. God doesn't sleep. God knows how everything happens, all right? So we are the, the farmer. We're the ones who go out and share the gospel and, and sow out the seed. And while we're kind of looking at, the, we're not responsible for what happens after that, Jesus is the one who makes the sprouting and the growth, and he's the one who builds his church. So we, we understand that we have the role of the farmer. We don't really know how it happens, but it does. We understand that the seed is like sharing the gospel. We understand that the sprouting, that's like a, when you share the gospel with someone, you invite them into faith and they hear the truth for the first time. They're not necessarily ready to give their life to Jesus at that moment, 
but something starts to take root and they start to, to ruminate on that truth. That's like a, a seed sprouting. But the growth, this growth process, we understand that it's a mystery to us. We are not responsible for making people accept the gospel. I cannot force someone to accept the good news of Jesus Christ. I can share the gospel. I can cast the seed. But ultimately what happens from that point and to the point where, where they're ready to give their life to Jesus, Jesus, th through the work of Jesus on the cross and the, the prompting of the Holy Spirit in their life, the Holy Spirit is the one that's, that's, that's doing that mysterious work. My brother and I, right, we're two guys. We're about two years apart. We would wrestle a lot growing up. And usually the way that wrestling process would end, right, is my brother, he's older than me, stronger than me. He would best me, right? He would, he would be on top of me with one knee on this shoulder, one knee on this shoulder, my back pinned to the ground. And you, some of you know exactly what he would do next, right? He'd take this knuckle right here and just start poking right here on the stern. I mean, anyone ever had that done to you? It's not really painful because it's, you're just like tapping, but for whatever reason, it's agonizingly painful. I don't get it. But he just kept tapping until I would say something like mercy or uncle or whatever. I'd eventually have to admit that he won, otherwise he was going to keep tapping on my sternum. Can you imagine if we use that as an evangelism strategy? And we just know someone that we really want them to give their life to Jesus. So we go over, we tackle them to the ground. We put our knees on their shoulders and just start tapping on their sternum and say, listen, I'm going to keep doing this until you proclaim that Jesus is Lord. Do it out loud with your mouth. Now, we all know that we'd probably get people to say, Jesus is Lord. Just get off me, right? But that would be a really lousy evangelism strategy because it wouldn't come from a place of authentic speech and authentic thought. It would just be something that we were forcing people to say. We can't make people accept the good news of the gospel. So what are we responsible for then? When we talk about the growth through evangelism, this width growth, what part does the church play? If we look at this parable, if we are the farmer, the farmer doesn't do nothing in this process. The farmer has a lot of work to do. Let me tell you what the church is responsible for. A farmer, first of all, tills the soil to prepare it for the seed. We're responsible as a church for making sure that when we do put seed out there, that it, it lands on fertile soil. We're going to talk more about that in a minute. The farmer is also responsible for sowing the seed. You'll notice in this, the farmer is the one who's out there sharing the gospel. That's part of our job as a church. We're called to go out and tell people the good news of the gospel. The farmer also comes back into the process at the end of the process, right? We're not responsible for the growth, right? We can't make someone give their life to Jesus. We can't make them grow, but we can be ready to harvest at the end of the process when someone has got to a place where they recognize that Jesus is the, the way, the truth, and the life. The church comes in back into the process, and we're responsible for then harvesting that growth and helping them make that first step uh, where they, they profess their, the, the, the name of Jesus and they, they take that initial step of obedience and baptism and we're responsible for walking them through that process too. You see, the church, the farmer, we have some part to play in this. And that gets us back to our big idea again. Let me say it again, just so eventually this will make sense. The best Width strategy is a depth strategy. Can you say that with me this time? You ready? The best width strategy is a depth strategy. Now let me tell you why I believe this to be true. Before we talk about, I'm going to talk a little bit more about width and before we talk about depth, but I want to understand that when, they, when a plant, when you put a seed in, a, in the ground, there's something that has to happen before it's going to be harvestable. When we share the gospel, there's certain things that have to happen before someone is ready to profess 
it with a genuine profession, right? That they want to be followers of Jesus. And that seed, it's the same way, okay? If you were to take a seed, right, you probably have had a, a preschooler or a kindergartner bring home from school or preschool, right, a little styrofoam cup filled with dirt. And you're thinking, this is the weirdest craft I've ever seen, right? But we actually know that you're supposed to put it up on the windowsill and put some water in it, and eventually something's going to grow up out of that. But when you get that first little shoot of life, right, and if you were to open up and, and ruin your kid's craft project, right, if you were to break that cup open and you're to look at that little seed, one of the things you will notice is that there, there's, there's something that's really important for this thing to actually get to a place where it's harvestable. It's got to, number one, there's got to be a shoot and there's got to be a root. It's pretty amazing, though. The first thing that happens when you get that shoot, there's usually not yet a root. In fact, if you think about that in the way that, think back to the, the moment that maybe you gave your life to Jesus, that someone shared the good news of the gospel with you. At that point, you didn't know God's word, back words and four words. You didn't know how to find Matthew, Mark, or Luke in it. You, you didn't know some of the, the, the things that maybe you know now. You didn't have any root. But the truth of the gospel was so appealing to you. The community, the, the, the life transformation you saw in other people, that was enough for your seed to shoot out a shoot. And to start saying, I, I, I want to explore this. Is, is Jesus really the way, the truth, and the life? Can I have the joy that I see in other believers? Is that available to me? And you get that shoot before you get a root. But we know eventually that little shoot, if there is no root, it's not going to thrive. And it's not ever going to be harvestable. It's never going to get to a place of real faith. And so if we understand that, we can actually think about it like this. Right? If there's no root and no shoot, you're definitely never going to have a faith, a saving faith to harvest. That's pretty obvious, right? A seed that doesn't grow or just gets picked off and, and disappears, right? There's no, there, nothing's going to happen there. There's going to be no saving faith. But if there's a shoot and never any root, that eventually will die as well. And there's going to be no saving faith to harvest, but likewise, if there's a root, but no shoot, there's going to be nothing to harvest, no saving faith. We actually see this in a parable that many of you now are familiar with. If you go backwards, two parables in the book of Mark. Mark chapter 4. We're going to see all four of these examples. What happens when there's no root and no shoot? What happens when there's a root, but no shoot? What happens when there's a shoot, but no root? And what happens when there's a root and a shoot? All right, here, bear with me. Let's read this parable. Mark chapter 4, verse 3. It says, listen, a farmer went out to plant some seed. There we are again. That's the church. The church, the, the, the followers of Christ. You are the farmer called to go out and plant seed, okay? It says, as he scattered it across his field, some of the seed fell on a footpath, and the birds came and ate it. That's the first one. It says, other seed fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. The seed sprouted quickly. We have a, a shoot because the soil was shallow, but the plant soon wilted under the hot sun, and since it didn't have deep roots, it died. That's the second one. How about this? Other seed fell among the thorns and grew up and choked out under the tender plants. So they produce no grain. That one is where you have some roots. The soil is really fertile for growth. We've got weeds growing up in there. But there's really going to be no healthy shoot. And then you have still other seeds fell on fertile soil. Don't miss that. Fertile soil. And they sprouted. And they grew. And they produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even 100 times as much as had been planted. And then he said, anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. I want you to understand and maybe look at this parable with fresh eyes today. Many of you have heard this parable before, but I want you to look at it from this perspective. I believe that today what God is showing us is that this parable is about irresponsible versus responsible soil preparation, 
seed sowing, and harvesting. Those are the things that we, the farmer, are responsible for, right? We're responsible to till the soil, to, to throw out the seed, and then to harvest it when someone's ready to give their life to Jesus. That's what we're responsible for. And this parable shows us the difference between doing those things irresponsibly and doing those things responsibly. I'll give you a, a quick rundown of what I mean by that. The first one was a footpath, right? It's when the farmers, if we are irresponsible and we cast our and share the gospel in places where there is no fertile soil that has been tilled properly, it's a trampled down footpath where birds are just going to come up and people have got other things going. A good example of this, all right? And I don't want anyone to hear me wrong. I know some of you in this room, you're thinking, I was saved by a street preacher, who is just standing on a box yelling things in my direction. I don't think that happens very often, which is why I would say a good example of, I think, irresponsible evangelism would be standing on a box in a busy street corner and yelling truth to people without any sort of relationship and without any sort of grace. Now, again, I go out on my sidewalk in front of my house, a footpath, and there's going to be some things growing in there. And I'm like, I don't know how that thing, I can't get it to die, but it's going to keep growing. God can use any form of evangelism. But I'm telling you, that's not going to be your best form of evangelism. You put seed out on a footpath and it's just going to get trampled. It's going to get eaten up. It's not going to have any fertile soil. That's kind of an a, a, a irresponsible place to, to sow seed, I think. That hail, fire, and brimstone evangelism on a street corner, it's probably not going to amount to much. Another way I think that we sometimes try to evangelize is that we cast seed on what I call rocky soil. In this case, it says the conditions are great for sprouting, but will inevitably turn into false confessions of faith. You know, there's people who get excited about the concept of salvation they get excited about the concept of community. They walk into a place like this on Sunday morning and they're thinking, where's this been my whole life? I need to be part of a community like this. They get excited about the concept of church, the concept of Jesus, the concept of joy, but they never really get it. They aren't willing to grow down into self-sacrifice and obedience. And so if I were trying to think of a church or a style of evangelism that I think kind of struggles with rocky soil, it would be churches that are so full of gimmicks. Their, their only thought is, how do I grow wide? How do I fill up these seats? What little show, what kind of whatever, what kind of gimmick, what do we got to do to fill up as many seats as possible in this place so that people feel really good about Jesus, they feel really good about Christians, and it's just sharing all the grace without any truth. And what happens is you have people who come in and their initial excitement is going to be like, I want to be a part of what's happening in this place. But at the end of the day, there are no roots that are growing down into the truth of the gospel. That happens far too often. They have every gimmick in the book to bring people into church and make them feel good about Jesus and Christians, but that's all width and no depth. You know, there's a saying within the church that whatever you win them with, you win them to. Let me explain what I mean by that. If you win people to a bunch of gimmicks, then all you've really won them to is a bunch of gimmicks. But if you win people with truth and grace and a deep, real understanding of the goodness of God, well, when they give their life over to, to that kind of truth and that good news of the gospel, well, that's what you've won them to and, and what you've won them with. The, the third kind of path was what we call the weeds. The farmer, right, we can go out and we can sow seed and we can put it into what I would call actually really fertile soil. The reason the weeds are growing there is because the soil is really great for growth. But there's just so many distractions above the surface that the growth is never going to actually happen. I think a, a great example of where I see this in American churches is a movement that isn't a new movement, but it's called the prosperity gospel. You see, prosperity gospel churches, they twist the gospel away 
from self-sacrifice and instead lean into you and what Jesus wants to do for you. See, the truth is Jesus does want to do incredible things for you, but the good news of the gospel is ultimately found in what Jesus has, has, has done for you so that when you give your life to him, we can turn around and bless him and give him glory and give him honor. We can be obedient to him and what he wants for our lives, not what we want for our lives. And what happens often within the prosperity gospel is you hear someone, it's usually within a setting where everyone is, is ready for growth. They want to hear the truth. The, the soil is kind of tilled but at the end of the day, there's so many promises, and they don't, they're not promises that come from God's Word about what happens after you give your life to Jesus, that you're so focused. Uh, there's so many distractions above the surface that you're never going to actually grow to a place where you're ready to, to make a real profession of faith based on the truth of God's Word. And that leads us to the, the fourth soil that we read about in that parable, which is the good soil. And we're talking about the this concept of, of, of width strategy and a depth strategy, I'm telling you, the good soil is, is so crucial because we read about here, the good soil is a place where the seeds that we sow are going to thrive. The good soil is where the truth is spoken boldly without really too much of a care in the world about how many toes get stepped on. It's also, though, a place where the truth gets shared with grace so that the seeds are able to, to take root and, and have a place that they can, can ruminate before they germinate. The good soil is where self-sacrifice and obedience to God's word are, is taught. It's where fellowship encourages growth and not destroys it. So I don't know about you, church, but if I'm looking at a bunch of farmers right now, can we agree that we don't want to be a dumb farmer? I don't want to throw out a bunch of seed in a bunch of places where it's not going to amount to anything. I want to be a church that knows that, hey, let's till some soil. Let's get rid of the weeds. Let's get rid of the rocks. Let's make sure this soil is ready to receive seed. And then let's scatter seed all over that bad boy. Let's get seed everywhere we can. Let's share the good news of the gospel with everyone. And then also let's be responsible in harvesting at the right time. And I think that kind of leads us back, right? When it leads us back to our big idea, the best width strategy is a depth strategy. So if we know we want to grow wide, I want to see as many people in this building as possible. And it's not just because I want a big church. It's because if every church in this community were full to capacity, there still wouldn't be enough room for all the people that don't know Jesus and Glen Burnie and beyond. I want to see the kingdom of God built as big as it can be until Jesus chooses to come back. So if we want to grow wide, we have to understand that we have to grow deep. In fact, here's what I would say. This is kind of uh, my favorite sentence of today. If you don't get anything else, get this. You ready? Depth is what ensures that we pursue width responsibly. When you and I as the church, pursue depth in our own lives, as we seek to be a church that has deep roots in truth, that means that we are going to be able to pursue width in a way that is responsible. Instead of being that dumb farmer who's just throwing seeds out any which way, that we're tilling the soil. We're sowing seed responsibly and then harvesting when ready. In Matthew 4.19, it actually says, Jesus called out to them, come Follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. You notice what's in this verse? It's actually an order of events. <laughs> Jesus says, first, come and follow me. The first thing you need to do before you go out there and start just spreading seed all over the place and spreading the gospel is you first need to grow deep into obedience. You need to understand what self-sacrifice looks like. You need to grow in Christ-likeness. You see, width is the best, oh, sorry, depth is the best, wi best width strategy. So let's look at depth real quick. I talked about width, what it means to grow this way, and how we need to, to be deep in order to do it. So let me tell you what deep means. 
Another word for depth would be discipleship. It means that you, as an individual part of this group called the church, need to be committed to growing more and more like Christ. This is what discipleship looks like. It, you're being discipled and disciplined into Christ-likeness. Matthew 28, we call the Great Commission. It says this, Therefore, this is the, the, the last command of Christ to the church, right? Therefore, church, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Do you notice what this verse doesn't say? Jesus doesn't say, all right, church, gather around, listen, here's our strategy. Go out and make new converts. He doesn't say, hey, church, go out there and fill up the church as as many butts and seats as you can manage. He doesn't say that. What he actually tells us to do in the Great Commission is, church, go out and make disciples. And then teach these disciples how to obey me and how to follow my commands. There's both width and depth in our Great Commission. See, depth, you ready for this? Depth is what makes us smart farmers. And here's what smart farmers do. I got a one, two, and three. I'm going to give them to you real quick. Number one, we need to be a church that's preparing the soil responsibly. We need to be preparing the soil responsibly. That means we need to be pre- preaching truth and grace. We need to be creating opportunities for growth. When we till up the soil, what we're doing is we're creating opportunities that when seed gets put in there, there's going to be a place where the seed can thrive, right? We do that through life groups and growth courses and discipleship programs. We also need to be a church that's teaching spiritual habits at home. We should, this should not be your only meal of the week from God's Word. You should be opening up this book on a regular basis so that when you come on a Sunday morning, you're actually already full and you're able to just come and worship God out of an overflow. If we want to till the soil responsibly, that's the kind of church we have to be. You know, I've learned that in order, if you were a farmer trying to till soil, it'd probably be helpful if you had the right tools to do that, right? I have a, a hobby. I like to buy old solid wood tables on Facebook Marketplace. Tables that people think are trash because they're, the stain's all messed up and the polyurethane's all gone and there's paint and everything. And I like to buy them and then I, I sand them down to the fresh wood and I put new stain on and new polyurethane. I love it. The first time I took on this project, I bought a table that was way too big. It was like a 15-foot table when you have four leaves in it. It was a really big table. And I, I didn't have the right tools. I, did, I sanded the entire table with one of those vibrating mouse sanders. It took forever. Eventually, I realized I do enjoy this work, but I probably should have the right tools to be able to sand a table. And so I invested in the right tools. Well, we need to be a church that's investing. And I'll tell you, we are a church that's investing. We have overseers and leaders and pastors and staff at this church that are working very hard and prayerfully to make sure that this soil is tilled properly and regularly. That we're getting rid of weeds, that we're getting rid of rocks, that the soil is, is, is ready for you to, to sow seed on top of it. The, the second thing, right, is we need to be sowing seed responsibly. Not just preparing the soil. You can get the soil ready all day long and never actually put any seed in it. That would be a waste of time. So we need to be sowing seed responsibly. We don't just throw seed every which way, but being very intentional. I'll tell you some of the ways we do that around here. One, we know it's important to build relationships with people we care about. You build relationships with people. You you create an environment where you can then sow seed into their life. Right? We need to share the gospel with people who are willing to listen. You know, the guy on a busy street corner who's got a, a meeting over here and he's heading to a meeting over here and he's walking by you, he's probably not ready to hear the truth of the gospel that you'd like to share with them. But boy, you have relationships in your life where people are ready 
and willing to listen to see how God has transformed you in such a radical way. You see, another way that we, we sow seed is that we invite people into this life-giving community. There's something special about this place. I love Sunday mornings because I love this family. And there's something that when someone comes in and sees this family for the first time, they're thinking, wow, this is life-giving, joy-giving. Something about inviting people into this place. That the other thing I think we're real intentional about is, is not being a church with a bunch of gimmicks. Because we're not a church that wants to just keep up gimmick after gimmick after gimmick to keep people coming. We just want to be a church. Every once in a while, we're going to do some cool special things to invite our community in. But at the end of the day, our, our, our gimmick is not a gimmick. It's just preaching God's word boldly with truth and grace. You know, there's a preacher, uh, Dwight L. Moody, D.L. Moody, who, he was once criticized for how he spread seed, how he shared the gospel. And someone came up to him and said, I don't like how you're sharing the gospel. And what he said back, I love this. He says, you know what? I like my way of doing it better than I like your way of not doing it. And the truth is that we are all responsible when we see that we've got some fertile soil and we're going to responsibly sow seed to sow seed in the lives of other people. The third thing that we need to be doing if we're going to be growing in depth, right, is we need to be harvesting the growth responsibly. We need to harvest growth responsibly. We need to be a church that teaches evangelism. We need to be a church that has regular invitations to people that when they're ready to give their life to Jesus, we're ready to receive them and invite them and, and give them the next steps in a new life in Christ. I love that our, our cover is always taken off this baptistry. We don't have baptism Sundays. Every Sunday is a baptism Sunday for someone who's ready to give their life to Jesus. So let's get, look at our big idea one more time. The best width strategy is a depth strategy. And let me explain with one more example, one of the best places I think we can see this in Scripture, and it's the book of Acts. If you're not familiar with God's Word, the book of Acts is the actual story. When Jesus says he's going to build his church, you can go to the book of Acts and actually watch him build the church. It's like the, the layout for how he's going to build the church because we see the church being built in the book of Acts. Well, in chapter 2, we have Pentecost, which is like this first moment where the church is, is being built. And it says in Acts chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, it says, At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. Now, I didn't give you a lot of context for this. Let me give you a little bit of context. The believers are gathered together, and the Holy Spirit comes and does this work, and it says that the loud noise was actually a, a loud noise from heaven and a mighty windstorm. And so the people, the Jews that are being talked about here, they actually heard an audible noise. They heard something crazy is going on over there, and we've got to go see what's going on over there. Now, listen, how cool would it be I'm not talking about a mighty windstorm or an audible noise from heaven, but how amazing would it be if God was doing such a powerful work in our lives in the way that we are growing deep in our roots and growing strong in our shoots, if there was something so awesome happening in this place that our community looked at what's happening at ACC and their only way of being able to describe it would be like, there is a loud noise coming from that building over there. I don't know what it is, but I see life change in my coworker. I see something so radically different about my neighbor. I see how God is working. I, I drive by that parking lot, and man, I can't even get by Aqua Heart Road. There's something happening there, and I've got to go in and see what it is. You see, that only happens with depth. That doesn't happen with this shallow width strategy. That happens when God is actually transforming lives releasing lives by the You see, the, the craziness inside the church was so crazy in that moment 
that the outsiders came in and they actually thought the people inside were drunk. How amazing would it be if God was doing such a powerful and radical work in your life that when people looked at you, I remember back in high school, I, remember I told you last week how much I love to dance. Well, I would go to high school dances and I would have so much fun on the dance floor that every dance, they would pull me aside and ask me to breathe into a breathalyzer. They're like, there's no way that anyone could be having that much fun without alcohol. And every time, it's like zero, zero, zero. How cool would it be if there was so much joy in this place, so much life change in this place, that when people look in, they're thinking, they've got to be drinking something. But what happens is they hadn't been drinking anything. Paul goes on and shares. He says, so let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified to be both Lord and Messiah. And then it says, Peter's words pierced their hearts. And then in verse 41, it says, those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day about 3,000 in all. To give you a context of that number, this church is made up now of about a somewhere between 1,000 and 1,200 people on a Sunday morning. 3,000 people were added to the church that day. One church. So that's what happens when depth is your width strategy. So we ask this question, what now, God? What can we do with this information? And I hope that God would be prompting you right now to be considering what is your part. Obviously, part of it is we all need to be committed to growing deep in discipleship. You need to be doing the work you need to be doing to become more like Christ. We have a discipleship program that's actually launching this fall. There's four different time slots that you can sign up for. Those are all open now for registration on our website. If you've wanted to go through the process of being discipled, you can go onto our website and sign up for one of those slots. To, you learn more about it. Just go to our website. It's under uh, one of the tabs. But here's the thing I really want to challenge us with. I believe that the soil has been tilled. I believe we have people ready to harvest responsibly. The job that we now have as a church is to go out and sow seed, to share the gospel with our neighbors, to share the gospel with our coworkers, to share the gospel with our family members. To, there's someone in this room that every one of us, there's someone that you know that you wish were part of a community of faith. You wish they knew Jesus. And so we have some tools today that we want you to be able to, to leave with. When you walk out of the doors today after we sing this last song, uh, you can grab some invite cards. They're little business card sized things. And leave those with people that are ready to hear the truth of the gospel. Invite them into this family of faith. Another thing that we have ready for you is we have these little folded invitation cards that are meant to be mailed to someone that you care about. And what we're going to do today is we want each of you to grab one of those and just write a handwritten letter, like two sentences. Hey, I'd really love for you to join me at my church next Sunday. I'll save you a seat. How simple is that? And then what you're going to do is put their address on the outside of the envelope and we'll put the stamp on it. We'll get it out in the mail this week. Do you know the open rate for a hand addressed envelope is like 100%? Who doesn't love to receive a letter handwritten to them? We're going to, we have that tool ready for you today so you can invite someone that you know and love to join you next Sunday in church. Maybe you could share your, your faith and share your community of faith uh, on social media. There's lots of ways, but ultimately we need to spread the seed and then trust Jesus with the results. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this thing called the church. Thank you for the last seven weeks that you've allowed us to study what it means to be a part of it. Those of us in this room who are brothers and sisters in Christ, we know that we're a church family. Those of us who are part of this thing, we know that we're like a building that's been built by you brick upon brick, where you're the cornerstone. God, we know that we're like a body 
that functions with health when all the parts are doing the things they're supposed to do. God, we know that we're a church that, that lasts. We, we've studied all these things together over the last seven weeks. And I just thank you for this series. And I pray that we would be a church that not only lasts, but that grows. You'd help us grow deep in our roots and tall in our shoots to be more like you. And that as we do that, others would see from the outside looking in, they'd hear a loud noise coming from this place. And that we would see the growth through width that you're already blessing us with. God, we love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this, you belong at ACC.